Nice. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Yes. I'm tired, too. It's fine. Um, so this talk um, started with a really uh, big and fluffy uh, problem and idea of mine. And, and it has grown the last few years into hopefully something that's a bit more concrete. I'm from the app field, working, uh, worked a lot with apps as I grew up. But then I sort of went into game design. So now I'm at Minecraft. It's very, very different. And I hope to share some of those insights that I got from the differences between these two fields. So the name of this talk is Where Did All the Feelings Go? And it's based in this hypothesis that I think we're in a utilitarian paradigm right now. So what that means for me is that we focus on how to create utilities when we build products to a very large degree. If we're going less on how you feel as a user of those utilities while using them. So we design apps as if emotionally engaging is in conflict with simple often. Maybe that we can't have both of those things at the same time. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Before that, though, a quick intro to me. So hi, hello, I'm Toby. I'm from the west coast of Sweden. Around there, this country of Fred Cottages, farms, Bill of the Bookshelf, ABBA, Swedish meatballs, and famous for standing in line really awkwardly. <laughs> and hopefully also maybe then famous for Spotify. So this is the company that I grew up at. Uh, when I reference um, companies, I often just actually talk about Spotify. I was accidentally made responsible for the UI design of all the apps when I was 21. Um, yes, that was uh, interesting. And then uh, I went to GitHub, and I was a um, web designer, but also a product designer there, or a web developer. Now I'm at Minecraft, and it's, of course, not only us designers that are creative at Minecraft, but a lot of people build really cool things with Minecraft. So here are some of the um, amazing things that people build. Here's the same thing from the top, this massive landscape. People usually or often build such things in Minecraft, right? So here's an underwater castle. A hidden or maybe secret tip to why we think this happens in Minecraft. Like, this doesn't happen in all apps nor um, games that people build such massive things. We believe it's because of low fidelity, right? So if you're working with Lego or if you're working with a CAD program, you, can, you could spend days and weeks designing a chair. You cannot do that in Minecraft because the blocks are one by one meters. So the low fidelity pushes you to create massive things because that's the only way actually that you can create things and communicate. And I think there's some interesting parallels there to when we design and when we choose low or high fidelity. So low fidelity in Minecraft, at least, pushes a lot of players to create really amazing things. So um, this is where I'm at, at right now. Um, and I'm going to focus a lot on emotion and being expressive with UI. But just to be clear, like this is not a talk on skeuomorphism, if you remember those lovely days. Um, here's how you could define skeuomorphism, an element of a graphical user interface that mimics physical object, like note-taking apps, offer skeuomorphs on yellow legal uh, pads, squared paper, ring binders, etc. Like you might remember this from iBooks a few years back, or iCal with these lovely leather bindings of Find My Friends. It just looks ace. It's not really about this, but I think this is sort of what happened when we went from skeuomorphism to an era of flat design. We started thinking that you could only be in one of these two. Like, we moved from there to here, and I think we lost a lot of nuance in that transition. And that nuance, I think, is emotion. So we can, we can create another spectrum to sort of try to grasp that a bit more concretely. So if I have one spectrum from an expressive app or experience to a utilitarian, and then on the other axis, we go from complex to minimalistic. And then we can map these quadrants out. So we can start here. Windows, so I'll actually work at Microsoft, so I'm not trying to um, be negative here, but it's a sort of 
complex and utilitarian philosophy behind this experience, right? You just throw a lot of functions in um, to the user experience, right? Whereas if we have a very expressive and complex experience, maybe we find something more like civilization that is extremely complex as a game, but very expressive. Then in the top left quadrant, we have maybe a simple but expressive game. So something like Threes. I'm not sure if you played this game. I spent way too many hours with it. Um, it's, it's a flat game. Um, it has tons of animations and sounds, and it's extremely expressive, but it's flat, minimalistic. Now, what I think happened is that we used to be sort of here in the middle-ish, at a, maybe a nice balance between being expressive and utilitarian. So the iCal app then looked like this. Now, of course, Apple left that with their transition from basically that experience to an experience which is in this upper quadrant of something that's very flat and utilitarian, which is not necessarily bad. I'm not saying it's bad or good. It's just where I think where they are at. So let's do an example of going in reverse and see where we can end up if we make a text app less utilitarian. So um, how would that look like? Well, we can remove some of this top stuff, and we start with text edit. Text edit is the same as the current iCal version, pretty minimalistic and utilitarian. It just gives you a lot of functions, no fuzz, um, so you can start editing your document, right? So what would, this is an exercise, what would a text app that's expressive and utilitarian um, or sorry, still simple and minimalistic, but expressive look like. So here's an example. Um, this app is called OmWriter. And it gives you, first of all, a nice background soundtrack. It gives you little clicks when you edit your text. It gives you a nice background. You can change all of this, right? You can change the background, you can change the clicks, you can change the music. And it's not here, of course, only to like give you power to write, but maybe to inspire you to get into a certain mood. Maybe this is not where you write your letter to your CEO on a Monday morning, but maybe this is where you can keep a diary, right? And express yourself in a different way. So this is just focusing on being expressive, but it's still minimalistic. So something that I had, I had, I had forgotten before I came into gaming was that simple and easy to use is not necessarily in conflict with expressive and engaging. Now, um, games seek and highly value their distinct look and feel. Like, you have experiences from Zelda to Overcooked to Limbo, Mirror's Edge, Braid, and Monument Valley. And they all look very, very different. They have their own unique, distinct look and feel. And on the opposite end, I think we are in a camp where maybe clean and simple uh, can easily become generic, and a lot of our apps have become clean and simple, which produces the same look and feel for every single experience. So here's some of the um, apps on my phone. Mail, uh, Messenger, Dropbox, Twitter, no, sorry, that's Dropbox. Whatever, you get the point. Um, so if you become generic, right, your brand becomes invisible, which is maybe fine for some. You might think that's like philosophically that's fine. You're not here to express your brand at all times. But what I, what I worry about more is that if we limit our expressiveness, we might limit ourselves in our quest to create great experiences. So that's really what I want to talk about and why I think this is worthy, like our time to find some nuance within this field. So I divided this talk, or the rest of the talk, into two parts. Uh, one is design dogmas, like beliefs that we held very strongly and believe in right now. And then two, how we can move towards expressiveness in our daily lives and in our workflows. So let's talk about design dogmas. I think a design dogma is a belief that um, designing according to a certain principle is unquestionably better than not doing so. Some that are very common right now is, for example, clean is better than not clean, minimal is better than not minimal, utility is prior number one, 
We have to, if we create an MVP, focus on it, just making it work. Retention is the best quantifiable proof of product quality, so that's what we measure and that's what we put as our north star. What isn't quantifiable isn't true. Maybe this is not as explicit in many of our lives, just implicit through that's the only thing we measure or we only care about the things that we can measure. So then everything else is not really true. Um, then, of course, what a user accomplishes is more important than how a user feels, sort of a consequence of that. And then I think if we believe in these too strongly, we might create worse designs. We, we should find some nuance. And I think we need to find some nuance because design, I think, is an art of prediction making. We often have one type of a product, one experience, and then we want to improve it. So we have some different ideas, we have some different versions that we want to create, and then we guess. We guess that this is better than this one and the current one, and in that guess there's an implicit prediction. We're predicting that it's going to be better. And when we have really strong beliefs, our prediction-making abilities become worse. So design dogmas can come in the way of making good predictions. Let's talk about predictions. Do you remember your first guess or first prediction in life? It's a difficult question. I think often it's this. What do you want to be when you grow up? I did some research. Here's Lucas. He's five. He's this. this. When I grow up, I'm going to work with rocks. For example, I'm going to throw them in the water so it creates a massive splash. <laughs> it's not a very good guess, but it's a, it's a cute guess. Here's someone who maybe studied uh, like product management and want to um, make it easier to keep promises. When I grow up, I'm seven. I want to be eight. <laughs> easier to, to nail that one. Here's more of a designer guess. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be a dog. <laughs> and here's, uh, here's a three-part guess, uh, probably my favorite. One, uh, I think I get a girlfriend. Two, kiss her. And then three, rule the world. <laughs> Which is, when I saw this, I thought it was a horrible guess. But then things happened. Uh, we've gone through a lot. We need to question, I think, uh, the dreams of, of Naive children. So the point, though, seriously, though, is I think we get better at making predictions with time. We grow up, we touch a stove, we get instant feedback, don't touch the stove, it hurts, and so we stop. But do we really get better at making predictions within projects? I think it's very difficult to work on a project for several years, and then you see some sort of output, and then you need to connect what did I do actually in this project, what did everyone else do, and what did actually that produce? Was it good or bad? It's extremely difficult because the feedback loop is so long. So let's just lean on some research for a moment and, and talk about is there a way of thinking that has been proven to make us better at making predictions. So there's a study that took over 20 years. It's called Good Judgment and Political Forecasting, and it's run by Philip Tetlock in Pennsylvania. And what they did is, is that they managed to run a study for that long and not only find a correlation between behaving a certain way, but a causal relationship between behaving a certain way and making better predictions. Now, you can practice your IQ. It's not IQ. IQ can actually bite you and make you produce worse predictions. We'll talk about why in a second. But basically, dogmatism leads to poor judgment. They listed uh, key traits of dogmatism as this. One, you're highly opinionated. Two, you have simple answers to difficult questions. Three, you're confident in your own ability to judge in any situation. Four, you have one view of the world, and then you change to the rules of proof to fit your own worldview. This is why having a high IQ can be bad for you. Because if you want to keep your worldview, like, I don't believe in climate change, maybe someone says, and you have a real high IQ, then as soon as you get or see new proof, you can use your high IQ to find a loophole in the evidence and keep your worldview. Lastly, you looked only for facts to prove yourself right. Now, if you behave in this way, it's likely that if you start doing or 
thinking about the world in the wrong way, you'll be stuck in that way of being. Now, the opposite then produces a better judgment, so a nuanced view to the world leads to better judgment. That is, for example, it's basically the opposite. Um, so carefully weigh proofs for and against, uh, complex answers to difficult questions, confident in the difficulty of judging in any certain situation, and you update the view um, of the world after being presented with new evidence, and lastly, you look for facts to prove yourself wrong. This sounds very difficult, um, but just as on a positive note, I think basically the last point here is the entire like, user test process. Like That's what we do. We create an experience, we do a user test in some way, and we're looking for facts to prove ourselves wrong so we can improve. We're not looking to, like, let's validate that it works great so we can go home. It's not really the effect of user research, right? It's to find our faults. So I think we're doing a good job, but we can do better. Now, if we visualize these two ways of being, we've got, over time, a dogmatic person thinks like this. You have one view of the world, and then over time, you have the same view. Nothing changes. If, if you're nuanced, maybe you think more like this. Maybe like we work um, as if we're working with um, a design that is driven by evolution, right? So we have one idea, and then we get some new information, and then we have two ideas, and maybe actually the ideas are in conflict with each other, so both of them can't be true, but it's fine. We can have two ideas and, and be sort of comfortable with not knowing actually what's true, and then the more information we get, the more nuanced and complex it becomes. Now, I want to really drive home the point of how difficult it is to think like this. So, I think one of the problems is with, maybe this is too big, but in society in general, is that often at like debate shows or on stage right now, we bring up people who are very opinionated and have strong opinions, because otherwise it's not fun. Otherwise, it's very confusing. So, imagine a debate show on TV where everyone just sat there and said, it depends. It's very difficult. Like it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really work. So we often, too, or we might also elect leaders that have really strong opinions. Oh, yes. I, I do work for Microsoft. Um, ignore that for a moment. How many remember this person? Yes, Steve <laughs> Palmer. Yes, Steve Palmer, he said this. Um, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share, no chance it's a $500 subsidized item. It's a link to that quote. If, if you get the slides later, you can look it up. And I just want to play a quick game here. So um, let's play Was Bulmer Right? Um, so please raise your hand. And if you think he was wrong, do a thumbs down. If you think he was mm, somewhat right, do a, like a middle thumb like this. And if you think he was completely right, do a thumbs up. So please just now raise your hand and vote real quick. What do you think about Steve's quote? Yes, we got a lot of middle and downwards thumbs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for playing. Let's be kind to Steve and uh, look at this old um, front page of the Forbes, the same month as Steve said this. The important part here, of course, being Nokia, one billion customers, can anyone catch the cell phone king? Maybe it wasn't obvious, at least to all of us, that iPhone was going to be a big success, right? So he also said some other things. We can take a look at those. Here's the full quote of what Steve said. It's sort of a funny question. Would, would I trade 96% of the market for 4% of the market? I want to have products that appeal to everybody. Now we'll get a chance to go through this again in phones and music players. He's referring to iPod. That was, if you remember, it was very big. Um, they may make a lot of money, but if you actually take a look at the 1.3 billion phones that get sold, I prefer to have our software in 60 or 70 or 80% of them than it would to have true 3, which is what Apple might get. Now, let's be kind to Steve again and actually take a look at the data. How did it go? If you, this is the data from like the deciding moment of the mobile industry. Look at Android, the green dot, and look at the dark blue iOS dot. You can ignore the top blue dot because it's Microsoft and it didn't go well. Um, so you can quickly see here how Android rises in market share. It looks for a while like iPod, uh, or sorry, iOS would catch up like around here, but alas, it does not happen. 
Android captures a lot of the market, although I have to say and iOS is still big, right? But this is basically what then happened to the market. This is what has been true since then. iOS is hovering around 20 and um, Android around 80. Now, he also said this, to be kind to Steve, they may make a lot of money. That's actually Apple's strategy, right? They don't, they're not necessarily out to capture the entire market. They're out to make a lot of money by selling a really expensive product, which we also saw recently how it's expanding. So this is the price tiers of the iPhones over time. And I'm sure if you're buying a new iPhone, but this is the latest sort of, haha, uh, -ha, yes, data um, on those prices. So I mean, he's, he's maybe somewhat right if we would vote again, right? Maybe somewhat. We can do this again. If we actually take a look at the 1.3 billion phones that get sold, that number refers to all phones, not just smartphones, as in like the Nokia feature phones, dumb phones, and smartphones. So the numbers that he's quoting is actually referring to this segment, not just a subsegment, as in here's the iPhone share, the green sort of small bar there, um, a few years after he said that. The title of this article, the iPhone share, 17 of all smartphones, four of all phones. So his guess was 2 to 4% market share. 2010, 4, 2011, 5. And maybe he was thinking about this. iPod had 74% of the market. And he's basically saying they won't have a significant market share with iOS, as in they won't have this. I, th I think he's pretty right. He's even nailing the exact numbers. So this is, this is the problem, like we're the problem. Um, this is John F. Kennedy. Uh, For the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and is honest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. This is why we need to talk about dogmas, especially within the design industry, because as humans, we excel at having the opinion that we're supposed or expected to have. Right now in the design industry, we're expected to like clean and minimalistic interfaces. So let's just talk about one of these. Clean is better. There's a great article by Jonas Downey of Basecamp, which is called Why I Love Ugly Messy Interfaces, and you probably do too. Please Google this, it's a great read. I'm gonna use some of the examples and quotes straight from his article. Uh, he puts up this image, which we might recognize, not because we've seen this site, but because we've seen hundreds of sites that look the same. Maybe the background is from unsplash.com, who knows? And then he says this, lovely designs like this have become so commonplace that beautiful and clean are almost baseline constraints for any new project. It's like every designer had the same Pinterest coffee shop fever dream and decided that the whole world had to become lifestyle chick. And nobody wants ugly, messy stuff, or do they? And then he brings up some examples, like Photoshop being a very powerful tool that we all maybe hate and love, but I certainly love it. Um, but it's messy. Right? It's very messy. Facebook too, at least on desktop, it's inherently messy. And then we might think, but surely it's despite that it's messy that it's successful, right? Which is a good counterpoint, but what we don't know is if it's true. We just know that it correlates, right? But maybe it's not as simple, at least, as we think. So another commonly held belief, I think, now is that what isn't quantifiable isn't true. This comes really from our habit of starting with that we have to define measurable goals as companies, as in measurable, as in quantifiable. Now, measurable goals will, of course, only capture what is measurable to begin with. And if you look at games, for example, there's a lot of things that are not capturable, I think, with our current technology, at least, so we can't actually have quantifiable goals. So many successful companies love A-B testing. They use it all the times. We work with KPIs and OKRs. We're on A-B tests to increase retention and acquisition. 
But what if most of the things that we care about are not actually quantifiable? So that's a problem that we have, especially in the gaming industry. Retention might even be a proxy to addiction, right? If we're making a game. So that's not good. You can also question, what are we out to create? Maybe happiness, right? Happiness is not quantifiable, I think, at least. You could try, but it's, you're probably going to fail. Fun, mm, delighted, maybe not. I think a lot of the things that we actually care about are not even measurable. So I think we should play with the idea of assuming that you will not be able to measure most of the improvements that you care about and play with that idea at the start of a project and see how that actually can change your process. That's what we might actually do at Minecraft at times. We say we won't be able to capture this, so let's not try. We can nuance that thought a bit, though, and create a spectrum. I love spectrums. Uh, the effects of measurable goals. So we could look at uh, measure nothing to measuring everything and see how that changes our process. Now, I think if we're in this corner, you can be driven, you can have design um, being driven by experience and reasoning as an experience of the people designing and a lot of qualitative, qualitative insights. You have a high risk of failure because you, you're not checking if you're actually failure or not because you're not measuring. Um, you can work really quickly though because you can just make like gut feeling decisions. Um, you're unsure of insights if it actually works or not, but it's easy to align that design with your core beliefs and values, which is especially important with gaming. Now, if you measure everything, it's basically the opposite. You can often design by committee, which is everyone just runs A-B tests. Um, and like you have micro ideas, small improvements rather than a big vision. And then you have a low risk of a regression, like you never make the experience worse because you test everything. That makes it really slow, but you are sure to accumulate insights over time. So this is a very expensive organization to run, but it's safe if you have the money. This is maybe where a startup or a gaming company wants to be at. But we probably all of us want to be somewhere in the middle, right? We just need to find our like best spot. Um, and then this is really easy to align with revenue and retention, which is Great for business, but maybe less great so for some of our design or values as designers. Now, let's talk about how we can move towards expressiveness if you want to. I think, first of all, we need to talk about, just start talking about this at your companies, which is a very generic piece of advice. So I want to make it a bit more concrete. When should you talk about it? I have an example where I think you can bring it up which is, what if you run an A-B test? This has happened to me a lot of times. What if you run an A-B test and it yields zero change, it changes nothing, neither good or bad. Now, what should you do? Should you launch the new design or not? This, I think, is a great moment to talk about the value of qualitative insights and what you believe is good. So I think what you should do here is that if you believe it's good, then just launch it. Because if we, if we just make this a mathematical formula, if we have quantitative tests on one side, and then we have quantitative tests like the result, plus your qualitative insights as in what you believe, and quant here is zero, both of them, surely this has some value. It's more than zero. And thus you should go with it. So you should use tests to avoid regressions, but not necessarily to find the improvements because the improvements can just be what you believe. Now, what if your team really cares about designing something that feels great to use, and you design that experience, you start building it, but you're short on time, you cut the scope and you find an MVP. I'm not sure if you've done this. <laughs> and then you launch something that doesn't feel great to use. <laughs> what went wrong? I think when we define MVPs, we naturally make them utilitarian, but because we can't cut the scope, we can't cut the scope so much that you can't use it, right? So since we can't launch something that doesn't work, MVPs tend to become very utilitarian. So I think 
of course, that's bad because the purpose of an MVP is often to launch something to maybe assess that feature's value and see if you can spend more time on that project. But if you cut all the feelings out of it, it's sort of like measuring the value of a subway system by putting out a really crappy bus. The experience is not going to be the same, right? The utility, it might be take you from point A to point B, um, but the experience is not the same. So how can we prevent this from, from happening? I think we need to make, first of all, this is very concrete, make feelings part of the feature spec or user stories. So don't say um, users want to get from point A to point B, but try to, if you have beliefs or feelings that you think are important, say users want to feel relaxed, safe, and undisturbed as they go from point A to point B. Make feelings part of the user story. So then when you reevaluate the MVP, you can actually re remind yourself of like these feelings are actually part of our core beliefs. We cannot cut them out of the MVP or MLP. Now, I think what you should do as a designer is also make sure to define in detail as you scope a feature how a minimum lovable product look like. An image or a sentence, I think, is often not enough. We shouldn't get stuck on just static mockups. So we need to then capture emotions, which I think we do when we prototype in high fidelity. So if we have a fidelity spectrum of, of prototyping tools, uh, maybe the lowest is paper, and then we do things like Marvel, and then we can use origami from Facebook or Framer, and then, or just build a custom web prototype. Now, what I think we should do is position ourselves, if we need to capture feelings, closer to here. Because this side is great for flows, like really complex flows, when we need to visualize the entire user journey of something. But it, if we're trying to capture emotion, this is great, because we can uh, prototype interactions in a much better way. This ties in, of course, into the question, should designers code? I think as designers, we should try, strive to be able to express ourselves and sometimes or communicate as clearly as possible. Sometimes that means learning how to code. If you're in that situation, please learn how to code. We um, all do in my team to some degree. We do it in different ways. We prototype all of our interactions in Origami Studio Framework or with HTML and CSS because we're, Minecraft is a company where we focus a lot on these things. So I want to have, take one concrete example for, for how that process can look like. This is in the middle of a redesign of the Minecraft UI. We had this sort of menu where you could, on iOS, pick an option. And then we asked ourselves the question, can we create a sense of awe when you launch the game? This feeling is very important to us. A sense of like, oh, that's nice. So we prototype that. We need to then use high fidelity tools to prototype that experience. This is one of the um, examples of how we try to solve it. We're here, if we watch that again, transitioning from the splash screen here straight into just a really big screenshot of your latest played world and then try to use really slow animations rather than quick ones to create a sense of like, oh, that's nice. So we try to design or define sense of awe as important. Utility is still important, but they're equally important. So utility is important, but we don't make it our only North Star. We have a couple of others, too. So I think we need to, if we, if we want to make progress within this, if it's, if it's an issue, um, a field of working, learn tools how to define design in high fidelity or how it feels will be designed by someone else. Maybe a developer that doesn't share your belief of how it should be looked like, so you'll just give the responsibility to someone else unless you can use these tools. Now, something that I think we can do, which is to which is plays into the same thinking, is embrace sound design. We're not, we don't talk about sound design a lot. Sound design within gaming is extremely important, and it's a big part of creating a very engaging experience. I think sound design got a bad rap because when we were all using desktop computers, it would be crazy if Facebook started making sounds when we hovered stuff. But 
with a phone, it's another situation, right? Because often we have headphones, we, have, we can control the sounds, with mute or not. So now we see a lot of apps actually embracing sound design. Um, Messenger has great um, sounds, if you ever use that, um, non-silenced. And I would encourage you to just pick up like an operating system from a game and play, play around with it, like Switch. So the Switch OS has a distinct sound, basically, for every single function. Right? It's not only really expressive, but actually, when you think of usability, it's a great feature, right? It instantly tells you what is happening, um, what did you click on, what's the current state, and they, Nintendo has always been magnificent at sound design. Um, sound design is respected within Japan, I feel like, more than other societies. But I encourage you to just like pick up a switch, listen to the sounds, and think about if you could maybe be inspired by some of these and apply them in, in your designs. I think in the end, what I'm trying to say is that um, an app that only focus on, focuses on utility is like a musician that only focuses on hitting the right notes, which is at least what I did as a kid when I started learning the instrument. Like you see notes and you hit them in the right order with the same velocity and force every single time, and it just sounds awful, even though you play the right, right notes. So we should do less of that because it's just boring. It doesn't really work. It doesn't have a great effect. So we should be more like Beyonce, maybe, and dare to express ourselves. And you might think when I say that, like, no, that I don't think that sort of experience is or like would fit in my app, then I encourage you at least to think about this spectrum. From, oh, sorry. There we go. From Minecraft to Excel, how playful should your experience be? And probably, I hope, you don't have to position yourself here. You maybe should not be Minecraft either, but at least maybe you can find some nuance in that. And I think something that you can think about if you want to start doing this is to just think about key moments in your experience where adding a lot of time, because it costs money, adding a lot of time doing something feel great is actually great for your type of app. This could be, for example, if you were Spotify and Discover Weekly being refilled, if you, if you like that playlist, uh, I do, um, every Monday, that's a key moment where you can just add a lot of time creating a really nice experience. So try to think of those like key moments in your experience. Can you spend some time prototyping that? If yes, please do. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Toby. Thank you. Um, the questions are pouring are pouring in, so I'm going to do my best to. Nice. Yeah. So, um, okay. This one I'm actually really, I'm into this one. Okay. So let's say you introduce a change that you really believe in, but it dings the metrics. Mm. How do you actually make the case for it in your company? Yes. Okay. First of all, it could be the case that you shouldn't, if if it does ding mm. the metrics. Um, but you could try to question if that is the right type of metric to be focusing on. Like, sometimes you could see second retention drop, but six-week retention stay the same. Mm -hmm. And then maybe it, it's fine. Right? That's a very sensitive like metric to argue. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe if it's just like, if it gets there faster, maybe it's the same thing. Um, you could also, this is really tricky though, if you start to look for metrics that could prove you right, mm -hmm. it's also not a good thing. Yeah. Um, so what we usually, or what Spotify often does, is they, they force you to decide when you start the test which metrics should, should your design affect, mm -hmm. and you cannot look at everything else afterwards, right. because that's just a way to find some sort of needle in a haystack that maybe you shouldn't find. It doesn't mm -hmm. prove you right. Mm -hmm. So. Track carefully. Okay. It's a tricky question. Maybe you shouldn't, but maybe try to question if it's the right metric. Okay. Okay. So question if it's the right metric. Um, so along these lines of testing, mm. 
So you talk about emotion, you talk about playfulness, you talk about these kinds of almost intangibles. How do you actually know that you've elicited the emotional response that you were hoping for, if that's even the intention? Yeah, I think call test is, is great, qualitative mm -hmm. interviews. We um, do a lot of those with kids because kids play our games. Mm -hmm. If you see someone smile, it, like, it means a lot. But I think often we just feel it ourselves too. If you show something to a colleague yeah. and that colleague is, yeah. is beaming with anxiety, yeah. uh, you, that's, that's a proof yeah. of, in ways. That's also, I think Layla talked about the limbic system and mirror neurons, like that's that mm. you can read. We're so, we're wired to read emotions off of other people. Yeah, so, okay, so it's kind of like how you're sensing it. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see, oh, there's a couple of those. Um, what do you think about the future of gamification? Gamification is tricky because it's, it's not, or often at least, it's not really applying the philosophy of gaming to mm. an app. It's more creating a mimic out of it and like using a lot of like progress meters and like you want an award, mm -hmm. which is really just a, a meta layer on top of a gaming experience, which is often not even desired by gamers. So I think, I think there's promise in listening to games, but the, like the current wave that we've seen of, seen of just pulling those sort of things into regular app experience, I hope it won't continue. <laughs> I just don't like it. <laughs> I don't just like using that. Um, and I think it's, yeah. it's basically like um, hack growth or mm -hmm. growth hacking. Mm -hmm. Uh, by using the, the cheapest mechanisms from gaming, mm -hmm. which could even be at times like gambling. So, so please listen to games, but not, but not in that way. So it gets into the dark pattern, yes. the addiction that you were talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, this one is like a slightly different. Um, so for beginners in design, uh, clear patterns is a really kind of an important thing to learn as you go along. What, what advice would you have for new designers in this Oh, space. in general. In general. I think, I know. That's very actually, big. I know it is kind of, sure. sorry. Sure. Just like, sure. Sure. Let's put it in the context of the Yeah, emotion. okay, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. What mindset? Yeah. Growth mindset. Growth mindset. Yeah, maybe. No, okay, so. Okay, mindset. Uh, clear principle. When you use motion maybe, mm -hmm. or I think maybe that's, that's something that's very broad, but I don't think you can have, or I think a key to creating an engaging experience is using, using motion. Motion is uh, extremely expressive, but what you should do with motion is try to express not only the current state of things, but what action is happening. Mm. This is you could Google action-driven animation if you want to read more about this. I've tried to, we're going to talk about this at the workshop tomorrow, uh, on Wednesday, Wednesday. too. Um, but we often talk a lot about states and then animation just being transitions between those states. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's using animation in the wrong way. We'll lose a lot of context. So you set out in the beginning to visualize what's happening. If a modal gum goes from being visible to not visible, you're just talking about states. You need to visualize, did you take action on the modal or did you cancel it? That's a very different type of action, and it's, it's um, in conflict with only visualizing states. Mm -hmm. So as a mindset then, oh, this is broad and long, but <laughs> try to, when you start adding animations and you, and you play around with it, visualize actions, what's happening, not transitions between states. Ah, right. So it's like future, mm. move yourself into the future. Ish. It's probably a good Close. summary. Yeah. Close enough, okay. Yeah. Um, so one big last question just came in. What is the greatest game of all time that embodies your presentation? Oh no. <laughs> the greatest game of all time. That embodies. Okay, okay, embodies. Um, I can't really answer to that, but I can answer to a game that I look up to a lot right now, which is um, a game that you saw briefly. It's called Overcooked. How many have played Overcooked in here? A few of us? Nice. 
What I really like with Overcooked is that they um, think about how to force you, when you play it, to talk to each other, which is just really warms my heart uh, when, you, when you think about it, because games don't have to be about that. They can be just a solo experience. But they attack, I think, a very interesting vertical, which is like, how do we make people talk in a room? And then they made a really engaging game around that. So I, I look up to that. I encourage you to look up some articles from the studio that created Overcooked and how they forced you to just start talking. Well, let's give um, Toby a big round of applause for closing out the day as well. Thank and, um, of course. Beautiful. Thank you.